but other than that, everyone's mics are enabled, um, so feel free to chime in, and we can just jump right in. <laughs> I'll turn this over to Carla. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I can uh, just chat about it. <laughs> I mean, I can share my screen, but Beth, um, you're the only one that actually posted a question, so can you clarify what you're asking? Because we're not totally clear. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so I have an accession from uh, a graduate student where it is uh, sap suckers. And the birds are collected across a hybrid zone. And so the student actually did um, very uh, genetic, genomic analysis of them. And so not only do I have like one birds that are identified as one species and birds that are identified as another species um, by molecular data, but I also have hybrids in between. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to figure out what's the best way in Arctos to identify those hybrids. I know we have the molecular drop-down option, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to, you know, is there a way to, to designate, besides for writing a very lengthy note and saying, see Sean's manuscript, mm -hmm. um, to identify, you know, if it's a, a F1 hybrid, F2 hybrid, or however Sean eventually wants to designate them all. Yeah, I mean, so you're using, you're putting them in Arthas as hybrids using the formula, right? Um, that's what I was planning on doing, yeah, but I, I'm, I guess I'm a little unclear on how to do the hybrids. I've done flicker hybrids, yeah. um, but I mean, I, those are all designated. So, um, let's see. That's one in here. Um, I mean, so what I would normally do in that case is, um, you know, but so the identification, you would choose the identification, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, I yeah, so you would choose the identification formula A times B, right? Okay. And once, when you do that, then you get two taxa. You get tax on A and tax on B. And so, however he's designated them, so Spirapicus ruber, so that would be the first one. So you just, you know, search for that one. Uh, and it's, you know, the Druber dagadi or whatever the subspecies is, you would select that, and then you would do Spirapicus gallus <coughs> as the second one. Use that, um, identified by, you know, Billerman, um, and whatever date, and then the ID would be molecular data, and then you'd have to really, the only way to, to to then be more specific would be to put in the identification remark something like, you know, F1 hybrid based on, you know, rat seek data or whatever it is. And then, you know, you can always link to the publication as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, that's sort of how I would handle that. Um, Does anybody else have any other ways that they deal with that sort of thing? So, Carla, quick question. So you did this one in um, your changing or modifying the uh, yeah. identification, adding identification after the well, specimen's been loaded. But, yeah. um, so if we're doing, if I'm like bulk loading or if I'm, um, when I'm doing the initial cataloging, should I just initially ca uh, catalog them as one of the two species? Well, I mean, and then you do it in data entry, um, or you can actually, if you're entering a new record in the data entry screen, you can build a formula there. I'm not sure about bulk loading, though. Maybe, Andy, do you know how you bulk can. loading is on anybody else? Yeah, you can. You can. Um, I've used hybrid or the word or or question mark. You can bulk load that way. You can, but uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Right. So, because okay. there was one point, uh, he's, he's he's changed that then because at one point you couldn't do that. You know, we used to try to enter 
like SSP, and it didn't like that. Mm -hmm. Dusty, Dusty, yeah. So you can. Yeah. Dusty's on here. There's documentation. I can't paste into the chat, but it's just search book loader, and there's a taxonomy sub editor thing. Okay. Um, so I'm in the um, handbook. Yeah. Um, let's see. So is it under identification? Uh, book loader. Okay. Search book loader. It's documentation bulk loader taxonomy. Bulk loader. How to deal with agent bulk loader results. That's the only thing I get for bulk loader. That doesn't seem right. You're on. You're under how to. So if you go to the documentation tab, maybe. But yeah, but the more specific details would have to go into identification remarks at this stage. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Are, are you also um, you're are you kind of related because I'm I'm also dealing with Sean's stuff actually. Um, uh, <laughs> photographs. Photograph at all? Uh, I'm sorry, Carla. You're like. Flipping in and out. I'm not sure if that's my connection or not. I'm in the you know, it's collection. At all? Uh, theoretically, there are photographs. I haven't received any of them yet. Yeah. Um, I actually have to get back to Sean because he put them in a box folder. I don't know if those are just the MVZ ones or not. Anyway, you and I should coordinate. Yeah. On that. Yeah. No. Theoretically, I think there also might be some uh, like sound recordings. But I'm not positive, yeah, that, I'm and maybe sure. a video or two. Uh, well, I'm not aware of that. I know there's a lot of photos. So, yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Um, anybody else? Hi, this is Marielle. Um, and I just on the subject of of identification. Um, I been talking a lot with Teresa, and, and I'm wondering if we could go over briefly the just the difference between identification and taxonomy and how that works in Arctos, just for other people too who might be tuning into this, um, especially when you have something complicated like um, a fossil with multiple species associated with it or a basket that might have different tax associated with it. Um, how do we deal with that in Arctos? Dusty, do you want to talk about it? Sure. So taxonomy is formal. There's, you should be able to come up with a publication. Identification is how taxonomy gets applied to specimens. <laughs> and in the case of a basket or a rock with a whole bunch of clams on it or something of the sort, that's basically administrative. Um, I think Teresa and I worked this out where essentially you, you, you should catalog all those things separately. And you're not going to have resources to do that right off, so you might catalog a rock with 10 flavors of clams on it or whatever, and you can deal with that a little bit with the A-string formula, which will accept any number of tax on names. But if one of those gets cited, if it, if it gets used, it should just be cataloged, and then you can link the new specimen back to the original with relationships. There's a split from lot or something of the sort. Okay. And so the A-string formula then initially can accommodate as many names as you want to add in. Yes, in two ways. The string can accommodate whatever you want. So you could just type rock, or you could type clam A, clam B, clam C, and then you can't do it in the bulk loader because it just doesn't have the structure for it. But from edit identification, you can pick a thousand tacks at a hook to that. <laughs> And if you get the right rock with some pollen guy involved, you might end up with a thousand taxa. So is this how we would then deal with environmental data or microbiome data where we have a sample that has multiple taxa? That I don't know. That's kind of weird. So you're talking about the stuff that Kendall does where you, you scoop a puddle. The Kendall does with? Yeah. You, yeah. 
And then also microbiome samples where you have, um, or soil samples where you're looking, you're doing a blast of all the possible taxa that could be in that sample. I suppose so. I don't know if anybody will ever actually have the resources to do that. But yeah, I think so. You've got the, the part is a, a cup of water that you scooped out of some puddle, and then you've got 10,000 taxa on it because everybody that throws any sort of bacterial blast at it is going to get something back. Okay. All right. So the um, A-string formula then, at least temporarily, and then you split things out yep. as needed. I think the A-string makes it discoverable. It doesn't make yeah. it very excitable, though. Cool. Yeah, and I've used that for, like, you know, if we have incoming field collections um, with, you know, potential new species and the researchers calling that, you know, Paramiscus species A or something um, until we get molecular data and then they actually publish the name um, as sort of a placeholder. Yeah, we've used that, too, for that. For that yeah. um, I think that's essentially what Derek does with insects, too. Mm -hmm. He catalogs a big jar of things that fly, and then it goes out. <laughs> And it comes back with a couple species picked off. And, you know, it goes out alone, and it comes back with a couple species and the rest. And then the rest goes out, and it comes back with some more stuff picked out. So while we're on, and so, oh, good, oh, I was just going to say, so so identifications live somewhere else other than taxonomy. So they're not muddying up the taxonomy tables or anything. Yes. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, right. And, you know, I know that a lot of effort has been made to clean up taxonomy and get these non-formal names out of there and into identification so that the taxonomy is just the nomenclature, the formalized nomenclature. And that's what it's yeah. Yeah, taxonomy is essentially fact. There, there's a publication or there's not. And identification is hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So kind of on the... Okay, great. Subject of identification. I don't. Is, I don't know if there's an issue. Maybe there is, and if there is, it's an old one about the whole nature of ID to um, vocabulary. Because I know we've talked multiple times about trying to sort of clean that up, go through that, make it more understandable. Um, is there an issue? With that? Something there may be a super old one. We should probably just start over because I think a lot of things have changed since then. Um, I think that would be a good thing to uh, maybe we can pull up that old issue and then kind of reprioritize it because um, so see if you put in if you put in a, a string with like the fifteen shells on there, uh, does that are you able to select that same string again? The next with the next record you want to enter? No. Yeah, you have to just have to re-enter each time. Yeah, although your browser will probably remember it or something, but from Arcto yeah. standpoint, no. Yeah, that's enough. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and for those of you who have just joined us, um, if you have any questions, your microphones are enabled. Um, so feel free to shout them out. Just make sure your little microphone icon at the top of your screen is green, and we'll be able to hear you. Uh, or you can feel free to type into the chat box. Um, so just since we're no questions, no specific questions, I did add a a related issue, a link to a related issue on. Um, so we were going to talk a little bit about bulk loader errors because that seems to be something that's sort of confusing to people. And part of it is, well, it is confusing. <laughs> and part of the reason it's confusing is just because of the way that the columns get sorted when you get the bulk loader error file. Um, so there is a related issue on that, um, and Doug, maybe you can speak to how easy it would be to, to order those columns in the order of the, like, the bulk loader builder, and have that loaded column be first. 
of that because one of the issues, like people just don't remember what that column that has the errors is, mm -hmm. and um, and it's it's buried in this huge bulk order error file, and so you got to know what the column name is and then find it. Um, yeah, I think we can. I'll just put it next test now. Oh, there it is. Um, it's not trivial but it's certainly possible and it seems like it's a fairly common thing so I think just prioritize it and let's do it. Yeah, I just put it as priority critical. <laughs> um, yeah, that, yeah. Um, as this came up in the, uh, we had a working group issues meeting last Thursday and this came up as an issue. There, so. Okay, and yeah, I, I just I think... added it to the an existing issue on just overall consistency in bulk order field names between different bulk orders. Okay. Yeah, um, I think we've got all the bits and pieces. We just need to pull some stuff together. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know if there is documentation. It would be worth, if not, it would be worth writing documentation on sort of how to interpret or what to look for in bulk order errors. So some of the things that are common. So I just had an issue with uh, Peter Miller from the book. Common things like looking for extra lines when you're importing from Excel. Oftentimes, you'll get extra lines down at the bottom that you need to get rid of. Um, or in this case, you had them between every row of record, which I'm not sure exactly how that happened. Um, and then, you know, making sure that your agents and your taxa names match what's in Arctos, your part names match, the dates are formatted correctly, things like that. So. I think it would be helpful to have sort of some frequent error, errors and what to do documentation. Yeah, something like how to uncode <laughs> or decode the, the errors. Um, and that ties in with Diana's question. She asks, for specimen bulk uploads, will Arctos flag incorrect scientific names, i.e. names that don't match the Arctos taxonomy after the bulk upload for review? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so when you so the way the bulk loader works is it sort of goes through it's like a two step process at least this is the way I view it. So the first step is making sure that all your column headers you know match um, correctly so that the column header names match what they're supposed to be. Um, but the, the second step is the actual values and so if it's um, it will show in this in this so the column that has the errors is called is called loaded. Um, and that's the one that I like to use at the beginning of the call. Uh, but it'll say taxon name, blah, 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 you know, um, does not exist. Um, so then you need to go through all of those and, and make sure that they, you know, maybe it's a misspelling in your book order file or maybe it's a new taxon that needs to be added. So. Does that answer? And Arctos can have both accepted and unaccepted names. So you want to, you can load the unaccepted names, or you can old, load older synonyms. But um, so you want to know which. Then you can update the taxonomy later. You need to decide, though, at the time of bulk loading, um, whether you want to load an unaccepted name or not. Is that true that you can bulk load unaccepted names during the bulk loader process? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so. You know, we do that when we're um, kind of uploading some of our legacy items. We'll, we'll do an initial bulk load um, with the old names, and then we'll do, there's a separate bulk loader template uh, for determination history. And so then you can add on sort of all the, um, the current names um, and then indicate that you want uh, those to be the, the primary name that's used, but you'll be able to see the, the entire determination history when you actually click on the specimen record. Yeah, and I think I added an issue to that too in, in the bulk loader when you're bulk loading. I think it would be really nice to be able to add the initial field identification and then if you go, you know, once it's in the museum and you either change ID or you, a lot of times we, um, you know, we'll identify the birds to subspecies and so what we upload is the subspecies because that's the final name, but we don't actually have the original field ID whoever the field collector was. So, Having a way to do both of those during the bulk loading process would be super okay. Maybe. 
made an issue for that. And so is that possible, Dustin? Yeah. Um, maybe it is with the extra thing. I'm trying to look at something that did that. So I think it's important to be clear that when you're loading the Can you uh, speak up a little bit? Um, I think it's important to be clear that when you're doing a bulk load, you're loading identification. Right. So can you hear me, Teresa? The yeah, you're still pretty quiet, Teresa. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what else. Yeah, make sure that you're loading identification. Okay. Correct. And uh, she was loading identifications when you bulk load, you're loading identification. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and one thing that Marielle brought up right before we started was actually um, the idea of just creating a checklist. Uh, bulk loading checklist so that you kind of, um, because there are all these additional templates um, that you, you may or may not want to use and so um, making sure that, you know, you're not leaving data on the table um, by remembering to kind of do that and go through a certain order of operations. So um, some folks will just kind of throw all their data into the regular bulk loader template and then just attempt to load it and see what errors come back. but. Um, some other folks might do a bit more, um, you know, try all their agent names. There's a special agent bulk loader. There's a special taxonomy bulk loader and just see what gets flagged before actually doing the larger template. So um, there's kind of a few different routes to do that, but having a checklist would be really useful. There's uh, something sort of like that for the pre-bulk loader in the documentation. I think that might be best as two separate documents, but maybe there's some, some links that can be made in there at least. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, the pre-bulk loader is useful because it will flag, uh, you can put your, your data in, it will flag if you're missing agents or if your any taxon names do not exist yet in Arctos. And it also spits out a list, which is useful to go back through and, and check against your data. It helps to find duplicates. But, um, anyway, anytime you're going to be bulk loading new data, you want to check for duplicates. You want to, you know, go through each column of agents or taxon names and look to see if there's any misspellings, to sort them, etc. But our, the pre-bulk loader will help with that for anything that um, doesn't match an existing agent or taxon name. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah, Dusty's mentioning that there's um, a scientific name checker under um, reports, the reports tab, um, that you can use to pre-check names. Yep, data services. There you go. That's useful. I didn't know that was there. <laughs> yeah, so any other questions on bulk loading specifically or anything else? One thing I'd like to mention in terms of new collections coming in is that um, if you go to the bulk load builder, that not all of those fields are required. Um, and so you can choose from the top group menu um, whether, I mean, which fields to check, for example, identifiers, agents, parts, etc. Um, and if you don't have data for something, like 
in most cases, unless they're absolutely required, you don't have to enter data for everything. Um, so there's no need. I guess there's if you go up to data, the data entry page is a nice way to go back and forth between the, the single record data entry page and the bulk loader and the bulk load builder. You know, you can find out which data is absolutely essential by looking at the data entry page, the single record page. Um, and again, when I'm bulk loading, I like to toggle back and forth between these two. So um, you can go to the bulk load builder, download a spreadsheet, but then look at this page and see everything in yellow. That's going to be what you're absolutely required to have in your in your bulk loader. Everything else is optional, at least for your initial initial load. And then this is useful to also because if you click on a field, it gives you the controlled vocabulary for that field uh, without having to go look it up separately in a code table. You can test a taxon name here, for example. You could type something in and hit tab, and you can check whether or not it's going to load. And you can check the variance. You can check whether a name is valid or invalid. Um, so when, when I'm creating a bulk load, Sheet. I like to I like to go back and forth between these two field uh, these two forms, and um, so I know what to put in my bulk load uh, spreadsheet. Yeah, and something that we're doing now um, those little little blue hypertext documentation um, links that are in the in the basic data entry page. Um, we're actually starting to do tutorials that, that are really short. So unlike webinars, where we're kind of just giving you an overview, um, we're going to start to do these little tutorials that are anywhere from like two to 10 minutes um, that, that you can actually um, find via the documentation link. So you can, you know, if you're filling, if you have a student or uh, someone new to data entry, they can just go ahead and click on those um, and then view a short video if they're uh, kind of questioning how, how to fill out a certain field. So I think that'll be really useful moving forward. So where will those videos be posted? They so they are posted on YouTube, but like, yeah, click on agents. So I just did one for agents, so it should be linked um, when you open that up. More information. Um, and so if you scroll down to the bottom there, there should be a link to the video, I believe. That's where Dusty put it. Uh, no, it's, uh, how to, we need to link those to. Oh, and the how to. I pasted it in the chat as well. Oh yeah, yeah. We were talking about how to um, kind of have sort of reciprocal links between those two, so it'll be like you know, see vi related videos. Um, but so we're trying to figure out a way to to make those really accessible. Okay, yeah, from the documentation makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So where's the where's an example of one? Sorry. Uh, how to cre probably under how to create agents. Yeah. I think it's in the chat. Yeah. In the Adobe thingy. Oh. Let's scroll down there too. I think it's here. There. Oh, right there. Uh -huh. Yeah, tutorial video. Cool. So, Dusty, are you planning to make a link from the documentation um, from the data entry, or are we, you know, how do we think people are going to do They can't barely hear you. Um, huh. Yeah, I think so. I think these things are awesome, and um, getting them in front of users would be really useful. I think there's a ton of information in there that it would take a book to type out. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's just useful to have these are really um, just helping you step by step walking through as, as people are actually doing actions in Arcto. So this is a plug for all of you. If you find yourself needing to create or edit uh, basically anything in Arctos, just um, make a quick little Google Zoom recording. Um, Google Zoom? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I thought that was kind of easiest for folks. Um, it's just something you can download and um, you can, you know, you share your screen and click record. And um, and then if you just give me the files, I'll, uh, you know, link that up with YouTube or have Dusty do that and um, we can get that, get that integrated. 
but it's really easy and they can really be two minutes um, just to show people, you know, imagine if you have a new volunteer who's really never worked at Arctos, um, how to do something. What is, yeah, um, would it be worth having a, besides having, I mean, in addition to having them buried in, in the documentation of how to create another link up here for video, video tutorials or something and just have a list of them directly to the in one spot? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um. And then that way it's like a one, you just go to one spot and look for what tutorials exist versus having to kind of dig them out of it bigger documentation. That would be useful in terms of knowing what additional ones we need to create. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll put a link to the uh, sign up. <laughs> so if you, if you find yourself wanting to do one, um, you can just sign up or it, just so I can know that it's been, it's been covered. I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, I like that. I think a, a new tab for tutorials and that's a good place for the the sign up thing and maybe a quick how to Google Zoom tutorial as well. Yeah, I I did um it'll it'll appear, yeah. So if you scroll to the right, I did like a mini tutorial there of just what buttons to click for Google Zoom. So I'd never done it before and you know, you can figure it out within two minutes. So Okay. Cool. Does anybody else have questions that's recently joined? Um, hi, this is Mary Beth. Um, I don't know, this is kind of short notice, but I'm curious about how you handle those. Can you increase uh, you your volume a little bit? Topic. So Mary Beth is asking how we handle loans in Arctos. Um, just generally, or do you have a specific question about loans? No, I, just in general, I'm curious because I know that once the paleo gets uploaded, that's going to be my uh, next source of, of uh, need uh -huh. to know. Yeah, so the first thing you need to do is make sure that whoever is doing the loan, so that would be you or whoever else, um, has managed transactions permissions, right? And then um, if you go to Manage Data Transactions, Create Loan, um, so Dusty has created, and do you have legacy loan loans that you're going to be entering? with numbers uh, probably, yeah. because so you know you can talk to Dusty about so this is super helpful so the next available loan number so when I go to do a bird loan I just click on MBZ bird that link and it pops up it fills in the next available um, loan number in R you know for us um, and everybody has different systems on how they do loans and how they number their loans um, so maybe, you know, you start at number one each year or whatever. And so you can talk with Dusty about that, mm -hmm. how you want that formatted. Um, and then, um, you know, basically fill in the field. And again, the yellow ones are required. Um, so, you know, who's authorized it, who, who the loan is to. Um, and then in-house contact and out -house con outside contact. Um, don't show is required, but if you don't fill those in, are those required just because if you don't fill them in, the loan invoice doesn't print correctly. Yep, they're required to print. That's it. Okay. Oh, really? They're required. Yeah. Yeah, so they probably should just be required because you presumably you're going to be printing a loan invoice. Um, and if you don't have something in those fields, it doesn't print correctly. So that's, that's an important thing. Um, and then, you know, you can choose your... 
your uh, loan type, and I don't know, Dusty, if you want to explain data loans, because that's kind of a different category of loans. Yes, there are um, two categories of loans. Data loans, loan specimens, where specimens are whatever some curator felt like giving a number. Every other type of loan loans parts, physical things. So the so way when you use a data loan, then um, what about? So if we want to say link um, specimens to a project, we need to do it through transactions. Like say for the Grinnell Resurvey project, you need to do it through transactions. And so we've created data loans for those. And then link that loan to the project that we actually haven't physically loaned any specimens. OK. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's an example. Um, and then, you know, return date's not required. But if you do put in a return date and you have a loan contact, here's the other thing is to make sure in your managed collection, um, uh, when you go to manage collection for that collection, that you have somebody that's a loan contact. So if you have a loan contact and a return due date, then you'll get some emails saying this loan is due and, you know, I don't know how often it sends it out, but 30 days or this loan is overdue or, or that sort of thing. Yeah, I think there's one at six months before and a month before and on the day of. Okay, good. And then like yearly after. Right. So you have to have both a return date and a loan contact, right, with a valid email address. Yeah. And then... Um, so we yeah. can determine how often we get notified? It's, you it's can only option. determine whether you do or not. Right. So Arctos determines the frequency of the notifications. Um, but whether you do or not depends on the data that you have in here. Um, We've also discussed having automated loan uh, notifications um, to the loan recipient yeah. and have that be an opt-in. This is something, I think, in under development so that the loan recipient you could choose whether they have an automated message saying that their loan is, is due um, and that they, or that they need to return any loan products, publications, et cetera. Right. So we have, there's a template email, and as Mario said, you could opt in or out of that on a loan per by loan basis. That's what we talked about in our last meeting. Um, because some loans, you may not want to send that email, and some loans you may. Um, so, Anyway, then you know, then you fill in the nature of material and any other instructions or whatever, and then hit create loan. And then when you actually have your loan, um, so let's just find a loan. Um, Uh, then you'll get a second set of fields for um, um, for your shipment. And so here's the shipment information. So this will come up when you, um, well, you'll get more fields. So once you create the loan, then you can add items to the loan. So click on Add Item. It'll get you to the search screen. And then you select your collection and whatever it is that you want to add, you know, by number or by taxon or whatever. And then you'll get, um, I'll show you just kind of what that looks like. Um, so you'll get something like this, and it'll have all the, it'll have the specimen number and all the different parts a barcode if there is one, and then you can either add the entire part or you can add a subsample. So like for tissues, you would take us, you would, you know, we're just subsampling, right? So you'd click subsample and then hit add. Um, that will create a new part as well. What's that? That will create a part as well as adding. 
That creates a new part, yeah, which is a subsample. So once you do all of that, then you can return to your loan. Um, you can review your loan items. Um, change the condition if you want to change the condition, add any remark, change the disposition. So when it comes back into the collection, you can change that from on loan to in collection, and you can do that all at once up here. Pick one, change disposition to in collection when it's anything. Okay, so that's like when it comes back. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. Um, and then you can print your loan your um, <laughs> your loan invoice by going to print any report. And then here's all the different reports. So if I want to print an MDZ loan header, I would print that. So select that and print it. And then I can I'll sign it. Um, and then the same for the invoice. So. MBZ loan. So those are typically different reports, the header, because that has the shipment information. And then the invoice has the details of the invoice that you're going to include with it. Um, and that's auto-populated from whatever you've added to the loan, so you don't have to type those separately. Right. And then down here is all of the shipment agents, so who packed it, how, you know, there's different shipment methods, so hand carried, FedEx, etc. You want to make sure that the person you're sending it to has a, an a, a valid address. So if you click here, pick address, um, um, you know, you'll get um, uh, all the shipping addresses, and so here's this one, use this address. It may sh show that it's valid or not valid, so you can select which one you want to choose. Um, who it shipped from. There's a tracking number. That's not required. Ship date, the weight, um, it's your value. Whether it's foreign, that's mostly for permits. It's kind of a prompt uh, to say, hey, this is a foreign shipment. There's nothing, it doesn't really do anything, but it's like, okay, this is a foreign shipment, so there should be permits, at least for like vertebrates involved in this. You can and that's useful if you're searching later at the end of the year, you want to know how many ex exports you had, or et cetera. You can also create multiple shipments. So if you're breaking up a, a loan into two shipments, you're dividing the specimens so they don't all go in one box, you can create multiple shipments with different dates and tracking numbers. You can associate your loan with a project. Oh, that's good. Um, right here, so if you type the project, um, Lever, um, and then um, so you have to create the project. Well, you actually, you can create it here too as well. But anyway, so you can select the project, or you can actually create it here. You can attach media to a loan. So sometimes we like if we loan um, uncatalogued material. So somebody wants some tissue samples. We haven't cataloged them yet. So there's no, no parts to attach to the specimen loan itself. We'll create a spreadsheet, just an Excel file spreadsheet of all of the specimens and the, the numbers, you know, the field numbers or whatever it is, and then create that as a media record that we upload and attach to the loan. So you can do things like that as well. Um, if you wanted to attach your correspondence, you could do that. Remember, media right now are public. Um, they're not limited to just the people in your collection being able to view those media. We are working on, at some point, hopefully getting some secure media storage. But just keep that in mind if you're associating media with the loan. Um, and then when the loan comes back, you know, you can just, you can close the loan and say what, what they it was closed. You can also search for all loans that are, you know, open, um, that are not consumable or whatever. So there's different ways of like searching to, to say, hey, you know, I have all these loans open. Which ones are overdue or whatever. So find uh, all loans that are not closed. Um, um, so for new collections coming in and you have a pile of existing loans, there is a bulk loader for putting in loans? Similar to all the other bulk letters, you 
can download a template with all the appropriate header gets and batch tools. There's two options there. You can create a loan with bulk load loan, or you can add items to the loans with the bulk load loan item. Yeah, and I and it's not just for new collections. I actually use that quite a bit. If somebody sends me a request for a hundred, you know, tissues, I'm like, okay, send me a spreadsheet because I don't want to type in a hundred numbers, and I'll just create a bulk load file um, according to the template. Um, and uh, plug those so numbers in your template, and so you can just upload a file with that, and uh, it saves a lot of time mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So, Carla, Nicole asked a question about tracking internal loans, which I think you would just handle that the same way as an external loan. Uh, there's an in-house option there. Right. So we, yeah, so we've been doing that more and more. But, um, yeah, so there's an option for this option for loan type. So in-house would be basically an internal loan. So you would choose that as the loan type. But otherwise, everything else would be pretty much the same. Um, we're usually not that uh, detailed on our in-house stuff, but probably a good thing to have that option. Yeah, we don't do it for every loan. I mean, well, we, I mean, we do it for every loan where people are actually using specimens, but or we're taking specimens, even if it's in-house. Um, but we've been doing it also for visitors. Like, if visitors come in and measure a bunch of specimens, I'm like, okay, oh, really? you know, send me a spreadsheet of what you measured. And then I'll bulk load, I'll create a loan and bulk load those loan items and have them sign it just as a way of tracking that. That's a good idea. Yeah, we, we, don't, good idea. we don't for every visitor. Like if somebody, if Peter Pyle comes in and he wants to just browse through the collection looking for a few things, I don't do it. But if somebody's here like for a week measuring a bunch of birds, then, then I want to track Yeah, them. we do that as well because it's, it's so good for reporting um, because typically the in-house visitors are going through, you know, 200 specimens, whereas maybe you're only going to loan. 15 specimens at a time. So um, Nicole followed up with, with the loan numbers need to be structured in the same way as external loans. And no, you can, um, the, the structure is free text. So you can use, you know, a date and a number or, you know, we, we um, have a lot of legacy loans that, you know, are only on paper files. And so when I bulk loaded those just to get a digital record of those, um, you know, I did like a legacy dash in the old loan number um, just to kind of keep those separate. So it's it's really whatever system you want to use. Yeah, I think the only constraint on that is if you're doing totally random things, I'm not going to be able to recommend the next number. Right, exactly. So the, the next number doesn't get auto-populated. Yeah, Teresa said she created a loan anytime anyone touched anything. I mean, I, in an ideal world, we would do that too, but um, just time-wise, <laughs> you know, if somebody comes in, to, so, right. And another another cool thing about attaching media to loans, so for a lot of our, um, you know, our taxidermy specimens that are going out on exhibit or being used, um, you know, in public programming or classes, we always actually do um, a condition report with those because they tend to get a little more um, fresh than your typical specimen. So we actually take pictures um, and you know close-ups of any damage so that we can, you know, if our if our public section you know creates some new hole or anything that that we can be like you know you're paying for us to you know get a conservator to fix this. So it's it's a nice feature to be able to attach those condition photos. So it looks like from media, you can search for all media that document a loan, but there's no way from loans to search for all loans with media. Oh, that's right. Issue. Should be fairly easy. <laughs> Create an issue for yeah. that. Should be easy to throw the photo to crack. Yeah. So these are, these are just examples, but yeah. And Mostly spreadsheets, but some pictures. A bunch of kind of handy. Yeah, mostly spreadsheets. Um. Yeah, and just to mention too, for those of you who haven't used loans yet, um, you saw Carla pull up her. 
the MVZ, you know, loan header and loan invoice, and um, you know, you can totally create your own custom form, but uh, you can also just borrow from other institutions. So you can, uh, you can actually, you know, say you create your own loan with your own data. You can actually pull up um, another institution's loan invoice and see if it were, you know, try to print that and, and see if that generates a PDF and kind of check out uh, what formats different institutions are using. And if you like it, then you can go ahead and just copy all of that um, that code and then use it for your own institution. So that's really nice. You don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. Wonderful. Yeah, that's, these are all the reports where you can just search for loan, all the loan ones. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of reports. You know, it's kind of a <laughs> But those are for labels as well, for specimen tags and things. And these are created in Cold Fusion Report Builder. Oh, really? so it's oh good. Nice to um, to borrow somebody else's template because it just makes it a lot easier to just tweak a few things and then re-upload them. Yeah. Sure. Okay, great. Does that does that help, there, Beth? Oh my gosh, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, good. And also, this is being recorded, right? So I'll it is. go yep. back <laughs> and Okay, good. Um, so I don't thank know you. we want to go over any of these bells and whistles in the last few minutes of. Um, Sure, I can go through um, just a quick one. I'm sure many of you, um, I'll request control here. Carla, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. So, um, I'll just go over uh, just a couple since we only have a few more minutes. Um, but I don't know if a lot of you use this, but I, I wanted to point out this uh, see results as feature. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so typically, you know, when you do any sort of query, you're you're viewing specimen records and you get the the listing, um, you know, that you're used to. But you can actually use uh, this little drop down menu and see your results um, in different formats. So I really like to use this, and I'll, I'll show you a few. So um, first, we'll do specimen summary, which I find helpful, and we'll just query. I'm going to query across institutions. I don't think I'm logged in, um, but I'm going to look up paramuscus. So I'm going to look up deer mice, and and I I like to do this just to sort of get a sense of um, what we have in the collection. So, um, you know, right now we have a grant in our herpetology collection, um, and we're actually moving all these specimens in and out and updating taxonomy. So uh, really to inform our move, you know, I would I would query, you know, one family um, and, and just see, you know, how many specimens do we have? Is it 1,000 or do we have, you know, 17,000, you know, iguanids? Um, and so it's a really nice way to, to, to see your data. Our specimen results. I mean, our specimen. Oh, sorry, I, I did that wrong. <laughs> I just did a regular query. So sorry. Um, yeah. So you'll go to specimen specimen summary um, and then group by. So I can group by um, sort of any of these parameters. Um, so any sort of taxonomy, but also um, location. And so I'm going to choose scientific name. And apologies, this will probably take a little bit longer um, since I'm querying across collections. Um, but it's going to give me sort of a table view, um, and and from there I can really it, everything it has links, so I can hop into sort of whatever species I want to want to look at. Um, but I'll let that chug on that for a little bit. It's a big genus. Yeah, it's a big genus. So you know I can sort by count. Um, what do we have the most of? I'm guessing is maniculatus. Yep. So I can kind of look through here. So. Um, you know, so say I'm looking um, for northern rock mouse. Where is that? Nasutus. Yeah, okay. So I can say, oh, wow, there's 1,063 specimens. I can check those out in my regular um, specimen results view. But another way to, um, I'll show you. So we, that's the specimen summary. So let's, look, let's take another look at this. Um, I'm going to look uh, in Berkeley Mapper. So I can map these guys. Um, 
and kind of have a, a different uh, entry point for, for looking at specimens. And again, I'm looking across institutions here. But so it's going to display the range. So I can see, you know, extents kind of northern Colorado um, all the way down into Mexico. And from here, you know, if I click some, oh, like this is the seems to be a southern southern extreme. Um, you know, that's going to actually bring up these specimens. And so that links. So then these are held at UTEP. So I can click on that and view the information here, the collecting information. So it's just a really different way to visualize. Um, your specimen results. And so this is in Berkeley Mapper, but I can also get um, the, the KML files for, um, you know, if I want to use, look at those in Google Earth. Um, and then one, one last one I want to show you is, um, do this again, uh, is this graph view. So you can kind of look at different Parameter. So let's just say I'm interested in looking at this rock mouse um, by state. So I can, oh, I've, I've defaulted to pie chart. So we'll just see the pie chart. So it's just, it's a nice little thing. I, I don't use it that much, but it is cool for um, reports, you know, just to get a quick and, uh, quick and dirty sort of graph. Um, I could also do, you know, maybe I'm interested in the year things were collected. Um, I'll do that by, uh, let's do a bar chart. Yes, yeah, so it's just kind of a fun thing to play with, um, and just a nice, a nice little way to show metrics. Um, so that's something that's cool. I like um, another thing I'll highlight is um, let's see this little spatial query tool. Um, so if I if I go into the locality kind of section and I click on Google Map. Um, you can use this little bounding box um, if I click on here. I can use a bounding box to actually perform queries, and, and that's really nice because, you know, typically when you're filling in all the data fields, you, you know, you're limited to sort of administrative units. So I, I'm limited to county or state or whatever. Um, and so this way I can actually, you know, maybe if I wanted to look at that mouse's range, I can kind of estimate where I think it is and, and do a query that way. And it's also really handy for marine localities so that you're not sort of doing this broad, you know, Pacific Ocean or, you know, an uh, economic zone or something like that. So you can really sort of um, uh, sort of limit your queries to, to a specific place. Um, and then lastly, I think I have time for one little thing. I'll also just point out um, this attribute search. Um, I like to use this quite a bit. Um, this is probably really handy for researchers. So maybe unclick this box here. Um, so like let's say I'm interested in like looking at nest, you know, nest materials or something. I can actually just, um, you know, click on this and maybe I don't want to type in so like specific materials, like maybe I don't care whether a nest is in an oak tree or made of grass, but I, I just want to know do we have records that have that sort of information? Um, I can just push search and that's going to come up with um, any record that has a nest, a nest description. Um, so again, I'm not, I'm looking across institutions here, but so I can just read um, descriptions. And so, you know, it's, it's a nice way to, to look at, you know, morphometric data um, and, you know, limit your searches by age class or, or whatnot. So those are kind of just a couple highlights I'd like to point out. Um, but. Any last questions that you all have? Um, let me stop sharing here. Let's see, I don't see any other questions in the chat. But um, yeah, great. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, if you all don't mind just taking that one minute um, web post webinar survey, that's actually how we found out that people wanted step by step really quick tutorials. So we do really value your feedback and try to apply it. So if you could um, just do that, that would be great. I dig bio would be really happy. And thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next month. Yep. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Thank you.